Grace and peace to you all from our God of many names, creator, sustainer, spirit, shepherd, guide for the journey. We were all on this crazy journey together, and I'm privileged and humbled to be with you all this morning as we journey together in worship. My name is Josh Lundy Whitler. I'm the Children, Youth, and Family Director here at St. Matthew's. Some of you I've had a chance to meet. Uh, some of you I've met only virtually through Zoom. And some of you may not know me yet um, really much at all. But either way, I'm very glad to be here with you all in this season. It's a different kind of service. It's not the typical service that we normally have because we're actually talking to you from the past. <laughs> we are talking to you on Wednesday. And uh, so this is a pre-recorded service. And uh, we're in the chat room right now with you all watching. So we're still together, even as we're doing this separately, we are still together as one body, one community in worship together. So I hope you can remember that and continue to keep each other in our hearts and prayers and our minds as we worship God together this morning. In uncertain times, in challenging times, in difficult times, we may not always know what to do or what to say or where to go or who to turn to. Worship is the answer. We come before God in worship when we don't have the answers, when we don't have the strength. We are here this morning, wherever you may be, wherever you may be coming from, wherever you are on the journey right now, you are welcome in our virtual space, and I hope that you find bread for the journey this morning. Our opening prayer is based on Psalm 86. Please join me in prayer. Incline your ear to your people, O Lord. Preserve the lives of those who serve you. Be gracious to all who mourn and gladden their hearts. For you, God, are good and forgiving, abounding in relentless love to all who call on you. Listen to the cries of your people who call for renewal. For there is no power, no weapon, and no nation that can stand against your love, which death cannot destroy. You alone are God. In all times and in all places, we walk in your way and in your truth. Walk with us along the path and teach us that we may be faithful to your call. We give thanks to you, God of heaven and earth, for this and every day. Amen. It is time now for our message for all ages. I, I've invited 
my friend here to help me out a little bit. Hi. That's Josiah. Many of you have met him already. Um, some of you haven't. Um, what do you like to be called? Jojo. You like to be called Jojo. So that's so you know. Um, I've invited Jojo here with me to answer some questions and to read a story with me. Does that sound okay? And I didn't prep you. Did I prep you at all? Did I give you the answers before we started? No. No, so you have no idea what we're going to talk about, do you? <laughs> okay, good. We're off to a great start. Um, do you like to go walking? Yes. When do we go walking? What do we do when we walk? Walk. We walk, and what else? We kind walk. of Walk. Yeah, and we like to be silly sometimes when we walk, right? Dance. You dance. What else do you do? Sometimes you play games when you're walking, too, yeah, right? Yeah, game, 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 game. Is... Uh, how do you know where we're going when we're walking? Oh. Um, I decided or well, my parents tell me. Your parents tell you. It's a good thing that we're there, right? So we can kind of help you know where to go. Or right? I might decide. So um, that's how you know where you're going when you're walking, when we're going around the neighborhood. What about in life? How do you know what the right thing to do is? How do you know when you're doing the right thing or making a, what we sometimes call it, making a good choice? Hmm. Very hard question. <laughs> well, great, huh? Uh, so you don't know? Do you have any ideas? I do. What? Because, because you can tell because, because, um, because if you're making someone angry, that means you're not, that's not a good choice. It could be that oftentimes. Or you're making someone sad. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah, or you're that... making someone. Or you're making someone. Or you're making someone scared. Oh well, th I can def. Yeah, definitely. If you're scaring somebody, well, those are good. Good thoughts, I think. Um, and, I and, wanted to. And, and and if you're even if they're not, that means that that's a good choice. Uh, maybe I mean that's certainly a good. And, and if you're okay. <laughs> You've never been short for words. I love you, bud. And um, cry out of joy. Well, so we've read this book before, right? Yeah. What book is this? Ruby you remember? Bridges. Ruby Bridges. Uh, do you remember this story? It's been a little while since we've read it, so I thought we'd read it together and share with our friends. Okay? So this is the story of Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was born in a small cabin near Tylertown, Mississippi. We were very poor, very, very poor, Ruby said. My daddy worked picking crops. We just barely got by. There were times when we didn't have much to eat. The people who owned the land were bringing in machines to pick up the crops, so my daddy lost his job, and that's when we had to move. I remember us leaving. I was four, I think. It's called sharecropping. In 1957, the family moved to New Orleans, Louisiana. Ruby's father became a janitor. Her mother took care of the children during the day. After they were tucked in bed, Ruby's mother went to work scrubbing floors in a bank. Every Sunday, the family went to church. We wanted our children to be near God's spirit, Ruby's mother said. We wanted them to start feeling close to God from the very start. At that same time, black children and white children, remember we've talked about what it means, what black and white mean when we're talking about people. Um, it went to separate schools in New Orleans. The children who were black, remember that we talk about with chocolatey skin or caramely mm -hmm. skin, different shades. They were not able to receive the same education as the white children who have what we call peachy skin or, um, you know, in daddy's case, kind of rosy red <laughs> and it wasn't fair and it was against the nation's law in 1960 a judge ordered four black girls to go to two white elementary schools this never happened before in the united states three of the girls were sent to mcdonough 19. six-year-old ruby bridges all by herself was sent to first grade in william france elementary school Ruby's parents were proud that their daughter had been chosen to take part in an important event in American history. They went to church. We sat there and prayed to God, Ruby's mother said, that we'd all be strong and have courage and get through any trouble. 
and Ruby would be a good girl and she'd hold her head up high and be a credit to her own people and a credit to all the American people. He prayed long and prayed hard. On Ruby's first day, a large crowd of angry white people gathered outside the France Elementary School. The people carried signs saying that they didn't want black children in a white school. People called Ruby names. Some wanted to hurt her. The city and the state police did not help Ruby. So the president of the United States ordered federal marshals to walk with Ruby into the school building. The marshals carried guns. Every day for weeks that turned into months, Ruby experienced that kind of school day. She walked to the France school surrounded by marshals. Wearing a clean dress and a bow in her hair and carrying her lunch pail, Ruby walked slowly for the first few blocks. As Ruby approached the school, she saw a crowd of people marching up and down the street. Men and women and children shouted at her. They pushed towards her. The marshals kept them from Ruby by threatening to arrest them. Ruby would hurry through the crowd and not say a word. The white people in the neighborhood would not send their children to school. When Ruby got inside the building, she was all alone except for her teacher, Mrs. Henry. There were no other children to keep Ruby company, to play with and learn with, to eat lunch with. But every day, Ruby went into the classroom with a big smile on her face, ready to get down to the business of learning. She was polite and she worked well at her desk, Mrs. Henry said. She enjoyed her time there. She didn't seem nervous or anxious or irritable or scared. She seemed as normal and relaxed as any child I've ever taught. So Ruby began learning how to read and write in an empty classroom, in an empty building. Sometimes I'd look at her and wonder how she did it, said Mrs. Henry how she went by those mobs and sat by herself, all, yet seemed, to s seemed so relaxed and comfortable. Mrs. Henry would question Ruby in order to find out if the girl was really nervous and afraid, even though she seemed so calm and confident. But Ruby kept saying she was doing fine. The teacher decided to wait and see if Ruby would keep on being so relaxed and hopeful, or if she'd gradually begin to wear down, or even decide that she no longer wanted to go to school. Then one morning something happened. Mrs. Henry stood by a window in her classroom as she usually did, watching Ruby walk towards the school. Suddenly, Ruby stopped right in front of the crowd, the mob of howling and screaming people. She stood there facing all those men and women. She seemed to be talking to them. Mrs. Henry saw Ruby's lips moving and wondered what Ruby could be saying. The crowd seemed ready to kill her. The marshals were frightened. They tried to persuade Ruby to move along. They tried to hurry her into the school, but Ruby wouldn't budge. Then Ruby stopped talking and went into the school. When she went into the classroom, Mrs. Henry asked her what happened. Mrs. Henry told Ruby that she'd been watching and that she was surprised when Ruby stopped and talked with the people in the mob. Ruby became irritated. I didn't stop and talk with them. She said, Ruby, I saw you talking, Mrs. Henry said. I saw your lips moving. I wasn't talking, said Ruby. I was praying. I was praying for them. Every morning, Ruby had stopped a few blocks away from school to say a prayer for the people who hated her. This morning, she had forgotten until she was already in the middle of the angry mob. So she had to say her prayer. When school was over for the day, Ruby hurried through the mob as usual. After she walks a few blocks and the crowd was behind her, Ruby said the prayer that she repeated twice a day, before and after school. Please, God, Try to forgive those people, because even if they say those bad things, they don't know what they're doing. So you could forgive them, just like you did those folks a long time ago when they said terrible things about you. And eventually, the kids, other kids in the town started going back to school again. So Ruby is still a hero, and she still goes around and talks today. But what did you think about the book? And what? she's a grown-up. She's a grown-up now, and she's still... I really want, do want to meet her. You want to meet her? Well, maybe we, you know, you never know. There might be an opportunity someday. But, you know, what did you think? How did Ruby know That's that... That's a, a, a... You don't know what... The, the prayer that she said at the end of the thing. Yeah, you, you, you read it. It, 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 it reminded me of... Remember when Jesus was on the cross? He told... He told that to the guards. He and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Yeah. That's really good thinking. No, that's right. Um, Jesus did say that. Um, 
no, that's really good. And I, I, that's exactly where she probably got the idea. She probably knew a lot about that story. So how did Ruby know the right thing to do? Hard question, huh? Yeah, but do you have any ideas? Maybe it had something to do with that prayer she said. Why do you think she said that prayer every time she went by the crowd? She's just praying for them. Yeah. Do you think that helped her? Do you think that gave her the strength that she needed? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Can we pray for strength when we're when things are tough and we need to be brave? Can we pray? Yeah. Do you want to pray? Can you pray with me now? Yeah, but about what? <laughs> well, let's close our eyes and you can repeat after me, okay? Repeat after me. Does that sound okay? Me. All right. But now I'm going to be totally mimicking. Well, in this case, mimicking is okay. I'm, I'm, we're going to allow it, all right? All right. You ready? You say, dear God. Dear God. Help me to listen to your spirit. Help me to listen to your spirit. And to be brave. And to be brave. To do the right thing. To do the right thing. Fill my heart with so much love. Fill my heart with so much love. That I can share that love with everyone. That I can share that love with everyone. Even those who are not kind. Those who are not kind. Amen. Amen. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for helping me. Okay, you can stop with the mimicking now. Okay, you, okay, you can stop with the mimicking now. Okay.
Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. Hear now the word of God. The child Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what, tra what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the, the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The word of life. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading for today is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 through 28, and verses 34 through 39. Hear now the words of Christ. Speaking to those who would persecute them, Jesus says to his disciples, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear those who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of God for us this morning. So here I am now talking to you all from my home, my intimate space, talking to you in your intimate space, just reading a wonderfully cheery passage that we just read. I'm going to guess that now in the future when you're watching this, we're all still dealing with quarantine life and with COVID-19. Of course, we've been at this for a while now. We're settling into a new normal. Of course, it's taking its toll not the least of which is the staggering toll it's taken on human life. Now there's some other stuff going on in the world too. There's some potentially sea changes in the way in which 
white and non-targeted people in this country are perceiving our policing systems. We're being awakened by what we're seeing and by the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And now we're adding Rayshard Brooks. Of course, these issues didn't just start happening. They didn't even just start getting videotaped. So even as people in Minneapolis are now working towards these new opportunities, these new approaches to community policing, and as cities like San Francisco are working to send social workers and other kinds of professionals to situations that don't require the police, suddenly now police reform is becoming politically advantageous. But those who've been fighting this fight for years, even decades, those who have been contending and dealing with police misconduct in their own lives for years, might be wondering, is this for real? And whether this whole thing affects your life personally or not, we know that we are living in a watershed moment. And that one way or the other, as people of faith, we have to be wondering, how should we be responding to this moment? But wait, folks, that's not all. We're, as you're watching this, we're about one week removed from saying goodbye to our dear friends, Beth and Steve, who have left a mark on this community in so many ways and have had a profound impact on our lives. Many of you are still grieving this loss and probably will be grieving it for some time, but that's okay. And by the way, Pastor Janu knows this and expects it. He'll be ready. He'll be fine, but it's hard. So, you know, there are a fair number of things going on right now. So, of course, I sit down to write and record this sermon many days before our service in the midst of everything going on. And I turn to the lectionary, the assigned passages of scripture for this Sunday. And what passages do I find? Hagar and Ishmael getting banished by Sarah into the wilderness. Jesus saying that he did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who lose their life will find it. Gee, thanks God. <laughs> Way to make this easy on me. So, you know, of course, I'm just getting to know you all. You only know me virtually, if at all. And so I would have preferred to preach something a little more encouraging or hope-filled, at least directly so, especially right now. This Matthew passage in particular is a toughie. To be honest, it's pretty par for the course for Matthew, who's really, really interested in you understanding that discipleship is serious business and not to be taken lightly. So now I'm asking myself, God... Is that the kind of sermon? Do we need to be talking about discipleship right now? And the answer that I got was, maybe. So we'll see how it goes. I happen to know that you all have had some conversations about discipleship and what it means. There is a pretty good definition on the website. The church's stated mission is to make disciples, which of course was Jesus's mission. So that's a good sign. In the Gospels, we see the disciples following after Jesus, literally and figuratively. That's what discipleship is, to be in a constant process of learning, which includes sometimes unlearning things, things that they thought they knew, in order to better be able to respond to the moment in front of them. So they watch Jesus heal, show love, restore people to fellowship, call out the powers of the age who oppress the poor, sit down at meals with those that society had rejected, embody a new reality, a new community for all that transcends human kingdoms and nations and all the ways that we divide each other against ourselves. And then right before this passage of ours, Jesus turns to those disciples and says, your turn. It's time for you to start living out the gospel this way yourselves. This way, it's what early Christians call themselves, the way. That's discipleship. And Jesus makes it clear this is not going to be easy. Just before this passage, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? He says, beware or they will hand you over to councils and flog you in the gathering places. You'll be dragged before governors and kings because of me in order to be a witness to the people. By the way, that's called state-sponsored terrorism when a ruler or government kills somebody primarily for the purposes 
of scaring a population into complacency and submission. When Jesus was put on the cross by the Roman government, that's exactly what that was. He was crucified on a hill in the outskirts of town, not just in some back room somewhere. Because Rome's general MO was, you don't mess with Rome, or you get what's coming to you. And so when Jesus says in verse 37 that the disciples have to take up a cross, he's telling the disciples just how serious this discipleship business is. It's indeed serious, and it's your mission, it's our mission, to be disciples and to make disciples, which does not mean beat people over the heads with their Bibles or convert them or compel them to convert, but to proclaim Christ by living out the way of Jesus, to be loving, to sit down with, to eat, to reconcile with each other, and as our own definition says, we do so building a caring and supporting and empowering community of faith through worship and formation and outreach and service, all as we work towards God's reign of justice and peace in the world. That's the mission. That mission transcends time and place. That as the church's universal identity, that St. Matthew's identity, great. Now what? Because the early Christians were called the way. They weren't called the destination. You remember from reading the Gospels that the disciples did a lot of their learning along the way. They didn't have it all figured out in advance. They learned by doing. They learned by watching and by experiencing the mission for themselves. And from those original disciples to generations upon generations of Christians after them, all different denominations, ethnicities, backgrounds, political realities, and as we Christians develop this tremendous corpus of history, and shared wisdom from all of these experiences. Here we now are. And yet with all this wisdom, we still learn by doing. We're still figuring it out because it's a different world. It's like playing a game of checkers that then morphs into a game of chess, that it turns out into a game of risk, that turns into a game of paintball, and so on and so forth. And each time you have to learn the rules as you go in the middle of the game that keeps changing on us. Discipleship is serious business. It's also a really confusing business. So this morning, I thought we'd talk about discipleship as a journey. It's a metaphor that Steve invoked just last Sunday, discipleship as a journey. I'm guessing it's not the first time that he's used this image. It's right there for us, built into the notion of the disciple. We're followers of a way, whether in easy times or challenging ones. There's a phrase from a Spanish poet, Antonio Machado, that gets picked up by the great educators Paulo Freire and Miles Horton. We make the road by walking. It's one of my favorite quotes. It's so simple, it's challenging and comforting. U.S. pastor and theologian Brian McLaren titled a book after this phrase, and he explains why in his foreword. Quote, Faith was never intended to be a destination a status, a holding tank, or a warehouse. Instead, it was to be a road, a path, a way out of old and destructive patterns into new and creative ones. As a road or way, it is always being extended into the future. If a spiritual community only points back to where it has been or only digs in its heels where it is now, it's a dead end or a parking lot. It's not a way. To be a living tradition, a living way, it must forever open itself forward and forever remain unfinished, even as it forever cherishes and learns from the growing treasury of its past. End quote. So how do we walk this road of faith? How are we supposed to navigate the unexpected twists and turns, especially when we're all sent home and we're losing our jobs because of a pandemic? When you're realizing that in institutions such as our policing and legal systems that many of us are raised to think of as inherently good, full stop, is actually deeply, fundamentally flawed That goes in ways that goes back to its very roots. And of course, some of you have known this for a long time. Some of you have experienced injustice for yourself and now see this wave of support for people from people who look a lot more like me than you, and you're wondering whether or not you can trust it or whether or not things are just going to go back 
eventually to the way they were before. How do we walk this road of economic uncertainty and political instability when our virtual lives seem to lack human decency and humanity and we can hide by our screens and forget that we're interacting as human beings separated by these screens? How do we walk the road? How do we walk the road without the wonderful guides that we've had these past nine years? How do we walk the road as a church with all these crazy new people coming in? How are we gonna build relationships with them and with each other through our phones and computers? I'm still asking these questions myself. I know Janu and his family will be too, and we're not gonna get it perfectly right. There's no manual to this. There's no roadmap. Beth and Steve could have written down everything that they knew about your community and everything that they have done with you from day one into the last, and we'd still be in this situation because we make the road by walking. We learn as we go. There was no roadmap for Hagar when Sarah had her banished. Not a great look for Sarah, by the way. But Hagar had to walk the road all by herself, reaching to the point of desperation where she expected to have to leave her child under a bush so she didn't have to watch her precious son die. It's in that desperation that she finds God. Indeed, the God that has been walking with her and Ishmael in their suffering all along. Hagar often gets the short shrift in more of a privileged retellings of the Genesis story. But Hagar and Ishmael were extremely important to God. Dolores Williams is a well-known theologian. She describes Hagar's experience as the experience of the marginalized, those who have journeyed with their children in isolation despite being cast aside and finding that God walks with them. This is not a way that any mother would choose, any parent would choose, and yet it's a story of survival and dignity that that injustice didn't have the last word on Hagar's life, that God walked with her through the journey in spite of it all. So you can see why this story has historically had deep resonance for those who are marginalized due to their race, class, gender, ethnicity. But there was no roadmap for Hagar. There was no roadmap for Ruby Bridges, who is now Ruby Nell Bridges Hall, who still speaks and is still an activist. But as a six-year-old, she knew the way, literally, to Franz Elementary School. She could see the building. She had armed marshals flanking her to guide her. But her real journey of faith was in that road that she walked day after day, passing all of that hatred that was being directed at a six-year-old girl. Her only guide for handling that was the faith that she had inherited from her family. Would that be enough? Would that give her the strength to do this day in, day out? To follow the way of the cross? Would it give her the strength to deal with those who would rather see her dead than be in their children's schools? And amazingly it did, but how could she have foreseen that as a six-year-old? What kept her going? How did she know that her prayers were doing anything? There's no roadmap. There's no roadmap for those who are marching in the streets today. Because we've been here before. Actually, there is a roadmap. There are, people have done it before, but every moment's different. This moment is different. There are challenges this time around that weren't before previous marches and movements, and there are opportunities, hopefully now, that weren't there before. And the question becomes, will we be courageous enough to reach for those opportunities? Is there a roadmap for St. Matthews? Certainly churches have undergone leadership changes before. But of course, this moment is different. And so far, you all have shown your resilience. A resilience that stems from your love. Love for God, for God's people. We still have some walking to do, but you all have some great tools to take with you on that journey. And you might find that there are some things that you're carrying with you that you may not need on the journey going forward. Or maybe you don't need them in the same way. There are things that you have learned over the years that will help you and us in this next stage together. And there are some things that you might have to unlearn or simply adjust or make space for something different, for a new way of understanding, a new path to forge that was never considered before. Either way, we make the road by walking. We learn as we go. That's how it's always been. Frankly, that's how it's supposed to be. After all, what is faith? If it's not 
following after the way of Jesus as best we can in the times and places that we're at. What is living in grace if it's not trusting in the relentless love of the Spirit that binds us together in different times and different places and helps us set our course together along that way that we might share this great love with each other and others? It's not easy. It requires patience combined with action and a willingness to always be learning, to never be done learning. But this time that we're in, has such an opportunity to teach us about ourselves, about each other, and about this community, and to trust in the Spirit along the way. We need not to be afraid to fail, for we make the road by walking. Discipleship is serious business. Matthew says we could lose our relationships, we could even lose our lives. As people who have protested know, love has a way of stoking the fires of hate but it can also awaken the fires of our shared humanity as a people made in the image of God. So will our faith sustain us for the journey? Maybe. We'll see how it goes. Amen. again. By the way, sorry for all the road noise. We live on a corner so it kind of comes with the territory. I'm outside now so that doesn't help matters either. 
but it was pretty bad inside too, so I'm not sure it's much worse out here. I guess I'll find out when I look at this clip. I come from the re Reformed tradition originally, where at least at one point in my journey, while I was um, in seminary and while my first work was in the Reformed church. And in the Reformed tradition, there's, we call this part of the service, the response. Responding to the word. Well, I'd like to ask you all to consider a literal response. I know we don't typically do that in churches, but I thought it would be a helpful thing, especially with us in this time. Plus, might help me out with the sermon in a couple of weeks, since I am preaching again in a couple of weeks. Because I'd love to hear from you all. So for our response, I was thinking, since we're talking about being on a journey, and talking about the things we've learned, and the things that we might need to unlearn, or let go of, or release, or give to God, I thought we could write down a thing that you want to take with you. Something that you've learned maybe, it could be something in the last couple of months while we've been under this particular stress of quarantine life. Maybe it's something that you've learned at St. Matthew's over the past several years. Something that you've grown, some way that you've grown. It could be anything really but something that you want to take with you, something that is going to, or you believe will give you energy, will give you life, will sustain you for the journey ahead. And then maybe something that you want to unlearn or need to unlearn or let go of. And by that, it, that doesn't necessarily mean push down, push aside, forget. It could mean let go as in give to God, release, or not needing this thing to control me anymore. Something like that. Something that you want to let go of or give to God in some way. Whatever that means for you in this space. So write down or type something that you want to take with you on a journey, on this journey going forward as a church, as a person, as a family and something that you want to release in some way. So write those two things down, and I would love if you would send them to me. I know that some of that might be private. If you want to send it to me and say, keep this anonymous, please, totally fine. If you want to do it and then not send it to me, that's totally okay too. But I'd love it if at least if some of you could send it to me, because I'd like to let those be part of the conversation for the July 5th service where Pastor Janu will be here, but I will still be leading the service. So if you want to do that, that'd be wonderful. And for the families, since I am the Children, Youth, and Family Director, I have a little extra idea if you want to give it a try. Um, what you could do is have somebody take a vote, a photo or video of you all doing this, but you can write down your something to hang on to or something that you've learned and then the thing that you want to let go of, write those down on little slips of paper and then go outside and then make sure that you have some water with you, but have a fire safe receptacle of some sort and like a metal or a glass bowl. And then as a family, say a prayer of gratitude, of acceptance, of we release this to God, we're thankful for the lessons we've learned, and we ask for the grace to let go of the things we need to let go of. And then bring a candle or some way to light the pieces of paper on fire and send them to God. Again, we're not destroying them because sometimes these things that we need to let go of are still part of ourselves and they're part of our journey. That was a really loud motorcycle. <laughs> you may not have heard that part. There may be things that um, when we let go of them, they're still a part of our journey. They don't, we don't necessarily stuff them away. Sometimes that's not the healthiest way to do it. But acknowledging them and then giving them to God can be very healthy and very healing and freeing for us.
It just depends on what it is. But then when you're done, when you're done releasing those things, you're not necessarily destroying them, but you're letting the smoke kind of take these things up to God. Then take the thing that you want to take with you, put it in your pocket, and go on a little walk as a family. Because you're walking together in this journey. So go ahead and try that this week or next week. And again, if you can send me those things, either the videos and photos that you took as a family or your uh, just your written down thing to hang on to and thing to let go, you can send those by email. I would love to see those. God bless. Hello again. For our prayer time this morning, we, as you know, are not live at this point moment. So this is normally when we would do the prayers from the chat box. But since we're not live, we're going to do it a little bit different this morning. I have here the prayers that we put in the chat box this past week that were sent out in the newsletter. And what I'd like to do is read them all so that we continue to keep these prayer requests in our hearts and our minds this morning. And then after that, I'm going to light some candles. And these candles represent us, our spirit, our lives, our presence together, even when we're apart. As I light these candles, if you could go ahead and write additional prayers, things that are on your heart, things that you want to bring before God this morning and before the community, and write those in the chat box, and we will record those, and of course, those will go out in the newsletter just as normal. And as I light the candles, if you all could pray for each other, because we are a community. We are a community of saints. We are a priesthood of all believers. So we can pray for each other. And so, and obviously we'll be in the chat room too. So we, I will actually be reading them and we will all be reading our prayers together at the same time. So we really are a community and we can pray for each other. So. Take a moment as I'm lighting the candles in silence to write your prayer requests, what might be, what you would like to lay before God this morning. And then look at what other people are writing and say, how can I lift my friend, my family member up on their journey this morning? Please join me in prayer. God, we want to remember this morning Sandy Russell, who was recently diagnosed with breast cancer for her son, Noah. For Sarah's boss, Steve, who is recovering from a stroke. For Sheila Lauer. For Louise Conboy, whose son died of cancer last week. We want to have continued prayers for all essential workers and for anybody who's returning to work. We pray for Andrea's niece, Jen, whose husband passed away this week, and for Andrea recovering from recurring back spasms. We pray for Ruthie's boyfriend, Stephen, who is having ACL surgery on Wednesday. We want to continue to pray as a community for all persons of color in this country who are exhausted, who are worn out, we pray that they continue to have strength for this part of their journey. May we journey together into something new. And may they feel the strength and peace and love of Christ. We pray prayers of comfort for Nancy Vaccaro on the recent death of her aunt and also her cat. We now, as a community, continue to lift up our prayers this morning.
These are our prayers this morning. God of heaven and earth, you created the one human family and endowed each person with great dignity. We give you thanks for the God image that lives within each of us and for the breath that animates us and the spirit that connects us. We pray for all who are in need. We pray especially for those who are lonely poor and sick, and for all who are not free, we pray that by your grace in us, we may be lovingly present for all who hurt in this world. We pray for justice and peace in the world. We pray for the healing of the earth and that we will repent of our abuse of it. We pray for the coming of your reign of mercy and justice. We especially ask for your mercy in the long work of overcoming the sin of racism. Grant us your grace in eliminating this blight from our hearts, our communities, our social and civil institutions. We pray for our church and for our friends Beth and Steve as they transition into a new phase of their lives as we transition into a new chapter in our community. We give thanks for all that we have learned and for the mutual blessings that we have shared. We pray for Janu, Janu Hewan, and Joshua as they also transition, preparing to join their lives with ours. Grant them the gifts of peace and courage, and continue to prepare our hearts to receive. We pray for one another and ask your blessing on everyone watching, whether alive or afterwards. While we may not be physically together, we remain your church and your people. As the body of Christ in the world, May we be led by your spirit and willingly go where the wind of your love blows us. This is our prayer. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns within us, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you all this morning. If there is a loved one or family member near you, hopefully those aren't mutually exclusive, <laughs> 
turn to them and share with them the peace of Christ. And share the peace of Christ with each other in the chat box. Remember, we're there, so we can share the peace of Christ with each other. So take a moment now to do so. Sorry, I'm making a tip on Susan this morning, but uh, thank you all for worshiping with us, and we just have a few announcements to share. And those of you who are in here with me right now can help me out, because I'm sure I'm going to miss some stuff here. But uh, I am the Children, Youth, and Family Director, at least that's what they tell me. So uh, I, I, the things that are on my mind right now are Vacation Bible School. Uh, we are actually going to do it this year. We're going to do a digital version, and hopefully by the time you're watching this, you will have seen some sort of announcement about registration and about volunteer sign-up. I really hope you see that by now. <laughs> if it hasn't, then um, my, my schedule hasn't gone well. But I'm hoping that you all will uh, take a moment to look at that, and if you're a family or even just anybody in the community is welcome to participate in it. It's, the program is going to be geared towards K through 6, but it's going to be a situation where everybody's going to be in it together. Uh, it's going to be very family oriented, and I hope that as one big family, we can all appreciate and enjoy that experience together. It'll be a digital BBS, so it won't be in this space, um, but it will be done from home. We'll be doing some artwork, and we'll be doing yoga and crafts. Some original music has been written for this uh, series. And we're just really excited about it. I think it's going to be really a lot of fun. And we're partnering with some other churches in the area to do it. So the dates for that are July 20th and 24th. And the time, of, some of it's going to be done live, some of it's going to be not live. So it should work for a variety of different family schedules. So that's my plug. I hope you all will uh, participate in some way, shape, or form, even if you're not you don't have any children or youth, maybe you could volunteer or be a part of it in some way, because this is a time for us to really, a way for us to really gather together as a community. Another thing that we could talk about this morning <laughs> is the book group. Uh, we're starting a new book group series uh, this coming Tuesday, and we're going to be reading the new Jim Crow, which uh, is very timely in this moment. And we're talking a lot about mass policing, um, policing and mass incarceration in this country. And the Anti-Racism Ecumenical Collaborative is a group that has been meeting to talk about issues of anti-racism in the community from a faith perspective for about nine, ten months now, nine, nine months now. And the group has evolved and it's been a, 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 another collaborative work between our church and some other area churches, South Acton Church and UCC Foxborough in particular. So we're going to be meeting on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock, and you're welcome to join us if you are available. And you're also willing to, if you want to be on our mailing list, you can email me, and I can make sure that you can at least get that information, even if you're not able to make the meetings. But we'll be working through the book slowly, and it's not required for you to do the reading every single week, or if you miss a week, it's okay. We are a very grace-filled group. So, and, and wherever you are on the journey also, because this is tough stuff that we're talking about, and we want to have grace with each other and respect for each other as we go through that. So anyway, those are my plugs. <laughs> um, other things that are going on. Celebrating uh, Ken Plant on June 28th. Uh, James, do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> we'll be acknowledging his service for so many years. So we'll be acknowledging Ken Plant's uh, uh, service to the community on during the service on June 28th. Yes. Okay. Doing any, yeah, that's good. Um, and I haven't actually had a chance to meet Ken, so I'm, I'm sad about that. But I've heard wonderful things about his music. I've gotten to hear a little bit of it. But I know he's been a very meaningful part of this community for a long time. So. Uh, something very exciting that happened last night was that at the council meeting, there was a vote, an overwhelming support to reinstall the Black Matter, Lives Matter sign in the yard of St. Matthew's. So this is very encouraging and a very timely moment uh, for us to be able to make that step again as a community. 
It is just a step, it's a, it's a symbol, but it's a very powerful symbol and it matters to people in our community. And it makes a statement. And hopefully with that statement comes increased action, increased exposure, increased advocacy as a community. So uh, that's wonderful news and I'm very glad for that decision. Um, and so if uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, to that end, the Mission and Outreach and Advocacy Committee is looking for people who are interested in joining a team to help St. Matthews become better informed and to work on issues of racism and injustice. And so if you're interested in being a part of that conversation, you're encouraged to contact, who should they contact, Susan? Wayne Lasante. Wayne Lasante. You should contact Wayne. <laughs> uh, that would be wonderful. Any other announcements that I'm missing? If there are other announcements, you can also write them in the chat. If there's other things that you're uh, wanting to let the community know about that I'm not remembering or I don't know about, <laughs> uh, go ahead and put them in the chat so that we can be aware of what's going on in the community. Uh, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you all for worshiping with us this morning. I know this is a, I've never preached to a, I guess I didn't really preach to an empty sanctuary, but uh, this is a new experience for me. And I'm, I'm just really thankful for this opportunity to be able to be in this space with you all. I, we're gonna close for a moment, um, in just a moment we're gonna close, but if we could just take a moment just to settle our hearts and our minds here at the close of our service. Just take a moment to reflect on where we're at in this moment of our journey. Maybe those things that we need, that we want to take with us, those lessons that we've learned. And maybe those things also that we might need to let go of, or unlearn, or release to God. You hold those in your heart this morning. I hope we all know and feel some way right now just the love that surrounds us, that surrounds you. You were made in the image of God, precious in the sight of God. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, wherever you're at right now in this moment. We have been together, we have gathered together, we have been strengthened and fed by the Word and by the Spirit. Pray now a blessing upon this service and upon this community. May the grace and peace and the love of God go with you wherever you are sent. May you be guided in the wilderness, on the journey, and protected in the storms. May God bring you along rejoicing at the wonders that God shows you. May God bring you home rejoicing into safety, into love, into community. In the name of the Father, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Holy Spirit. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears. From death into life. God is my shepherd, so nothing shall I want. I rest in the meadows of faithfulness and love. I walk by the quiet waters of peace. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants. Beyond my fears, from death into life. Gently you raise me and heal my weary soul. You lead me by pathways of righteousness and truth. My spirit shall sing the music of your name. death into love. 
Though I should wander the valley of death, I fear no evil, for you were at my side. Your rod and your staff, my comfort and my home. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Set me a banquet of love in the face of hatred, crowning me with love beyond my power to hold. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. And mercy follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of my God forevermore. Shepherd me, O God.